So, hello everyone. Uh, today we will start with our class and in this class we are going to talk about nutrition in human beings. But before I start my class, I would like to remind you that we have physics, chemistry, biology and mathematics classes for classes 8, 9 and 10 CBSC. We have physics, chemistry and mathematics classes as of now for classes 8, 9 and 10 ICSC. We also have master coding with Java, Java classes, Python programming classes, physics and chemistry classes for Cambridge IGCSE uh, courses. So please feel free to join and if you know anyone who would be interested to join, let them know so that we can have more people in our uh, community. Okay. So let us uh, straight away go into the lesson for today. So today's lesson starts with the concept of nutrition in human beings and as we had discussed in the last class that in human beings the type of nutrition that we see is known as holozoic nutrition okay so holozoic nutrition is a process by which we take complex food as a whole and then we break it down so it is uh, it, this is a type of complete animal nutrition that we see where we take complex food and then we break it down so we take complex food into our body and then we break it down into their simple form. So in human beings also, we have this kind of holozoic nutrition. Okay. Now the steps of holozoic nutrition, you all will be able to identify with this part of the chapter really well because of course this is about us. So think about it, ingestion, first and foremost you have to take the food inside your elementary canal. So when you take the food inside your elementary canal, that process is known as ingestion right so during the process of ingestion we use hands some people use fork that's all right but the main organs that are helping in ingestion are your lips tongue teeth which are actually taking the food in and keeping it inside while, while you are you know uh, chewing it and swallowing it next then when the food goes inside your elementary canal you start digesting it digesting it so what is the meaning of digestion the meaning of digestion is the same as we just discussed we take complex food and we convert them into their simplest assimilable form. Assimilable form. Now, what does this mean? Let's say you want to build muscles and your doctor told you that, you know, or your trainer has told you that, you know, you want, if you want to build muscles, you have to have more protein. So you start having protein. Let's say you're having egg or you're having chicken or you're having any other form of meat or you're having soya bean or you're having mushrooms which are all which are very rich sources of protein you're having that if the protein comes into your body let's say you had chicken so that you have basically had chicken muscle and the chicken muscle had protein so you took the chicken and you thought that the chicken muscle will become your muscle that doesn't happen so what happens is this entire protein that comes from outside needs to be broken down into their simplest form because large protein molecules cannot go inside your cell. So the protein that is coming from chicken or egg or mushroom is their protein, but you need to build your protein. So for that you need amino acids. Proteins are made up of amino acids. So what you need to do is the protein that is coming from outside, you break it down into amino acids, let that amino acid go into your cell and inside your cell you build your own protein. So that is how it works. So during the process of digestion, you have to digest, that is you have to break down the complex food into their simplest form. And when I say assimilable form, assimilable means something that can be assimilated. That is something that can be put into the cell. You cannot have large protein, large carbohydrate, large fat because that will not enter the cell. That might not be able to enter the cell. So you need the simplest forms which can assimilate, that is which can go inside your cell. Okay. Now, after you have digested the food, your blood needs to take the food from your intestine to different parts of the body. So, this process is known as absorption. So, when your blood takes the food from the uh, intestine, that is from the elementary canal into blood, the process is called absorption. Then, after the blood has taken the food to your tissue, the food has to be, the simplest form has to be incorporated in your cell. So that is known as assimilation. Uh, to assimilate means to take something from outside and to make it make it your own. I'm not talking about stealing here. So I'm basically talking about taking something from outside and putting it inside your cell so that it becomes a part of your cell. All right. So this assimilation, this assimilation is the process by which food which was going through blood to different parts of your body goes inside the cell. Alright, so you assimilate 
and finally whatever you could not digest whatever you could not assimilate or absorb the undigested part is given out of your body and that process is called elimination uh, sorry that process is called egestion okay so you have five steps in the process of nutrition i will repeat those five steps number 1 ingestion where you take the food from outside into your elementary canal okay and in that process your mouth your tongue your teeth they help second digestion in this process the food that you have taken inside it is in the complex form it is broken down into its simplest form three you absorb the food meaning the digested food needs to be taken into your blood so it needs to be absorbed four it needs to be assimilated meaning the blood has to take the digested food to different parts of your body and put the food into your cell that is assimilation and finally whatever you could not assimilate whatever you could not absorb because you could not digest you give it out of your body okay now here a very common question comes into uh, play what is the difference between excretion and egestion this is a very common question that comes into our mind what is the difference between excretion and egestion yes aryan says that egestion means the elimination of undigested food but excretion is the removal of excretion means the removal of metabolic waste absolutely so yes many of you have given me the correct answer that in excretion the process of excretion involves giving out of metabolic waste meaning those wastes on which have been formed after a reaction so those wastes which have been formed after a reaction inside the cell anabolism or catabolism those are known as metabolic wastes and when you give those out that is called excretion but egestion is the giving out of you know waste which is basically undigested and undigested food means actually that there ha there has been no reaction on this food there has been no enzymatic reaction on this food okay so this is undigested food on which your body could not act like say if you consume a lot of paper your body will not be able to digest it or carry out any chemical reaction for it on it because you do not have the enzyme needed for Uh, breaking it down so there has been no uh, chemical reaction and especially inside the cell there has been no chemical reaction they did not even go inside the cell so egestion is the giving out of undigested food on which no reaction has taken place and metabolic uh, excretion is the giving out of metabolic waste which has been formed after excre uh, after metabolism that is cellular reaction has taken place okay we go to our second slide so here we will just talk about the elementary system a little bit so any system is made up of organs and the elementary system is made up of two parts the elementary canal and the digestive gland so what is the elementary canal so it is of the hollow canal which starts from your mouth and ends in the anus so it starts from the mouth and ends at the anus and it is not of the same diameter or shape everywhere so in certain places they are straight tube in the form of a straight tube in certain regions they are in the form of a sac okay in certain regions they are in the form of a coiled tube in certain regions they are in the form of a flask but this hollow canal which starts from the mouth and ends at the anus it is known as the elementary canal but the when the food passes through the elementary canal there cannot be any process of digestion if you do not have these substances which are known as enzymes and these enzymes are extremely important for any kind of digestion to take place without enzymes your elementary canal is just a tube your food will pass through the canal but no reaction will take place because for any reaction in our body you know that we need enzymes why do we need enzymes we will come to that a little later okay so we have two parts one we have the elementary canal and two we have the digestive glands so digestive glands secrete enzymes that are necessary for digestion and the hollow canal acts as the region where this digestion will take place okay so let us talk about enzymes a little bit which are very important for any kind of reaction in our body just know this that most of the reaction that reactions that take in our body might also take place without an enzyme but with the enzyme it takes less time and less energy without enzyme it will take so much time and so much energy that it you might not survive till then okay some enzymes when they are released along with water etc mucus etc they are called juices okay but uh, the correct word for this specific specific substance is enzyme 
let's come to enzymes and what these enzymes are so enzymes are basically proteins which have a specific shape so you see this is an enzyme this is an enzyme and this is our substrate what is a substrate a substrate is something that the enzyme is acting on okay a substrate is something that the enzyme will react with and as you can see an enzyme which is always mostly not mostly just there's only one exception all the enzymes are protein in nature except one type of enzyme which is rna rna enzyme so enzymes are proteins which have three dimensional cavities somewhere now here i have drawn a triangular shape there might be a different shape so this triangular cavity that enzymes have these are known as active sites these are known as active sites so you see the shape of the substrate and the shape of the active site they are complementary to each other that is they they fit in a certain manner now this fit in this diagram i'm showing it to you as a physical fit meaning as a fit in the shape but this fit could also mean fit in charge they should be complementary in charge they should be complementary chemically also okay so the active site of the enzyme is usually complementary with the substrate that they act on let's say this is a protein digesting enzyme so this substrate is the protein so the protein will be complementary to the active site of the protein site digesting enzyme now what does the active site do the active site actually carries out the catalysis okay that is it increases the rate of reaction so these enzymes when the substrate adds or attaches to the active site of the enzyme we call it the enzyme substrate complex and after the enzyme has reacted with the substrate after this attachment a product is formed as you can see the product has a different shape so it is released from the active site and the enzyme comes back to its original condition so an enzyme does not change after the reaction only the substrate changes to a product so which kind of a substance shows this kind of a reaction where they can um, you know catalyze they can you know increase the rate of a reaction but they remain unchanged after the reaction we call them catalysts so enzymes are catalysts why one because they accelerate the rate of reactions and two because they remain unchanged before and after the reaction that is why they are known as catalysts and why are they called biological catalysts because they are found in living systems they are found in living systems so that is why they are known as biological catalysts okay so is this clear how an enzyme works so every enzyme will have a specific kind of an active site and the substrate that it acts on will have complementary structure to the active site and the enzyme will bind to the substrate and then produce react with it and produce the product at a low energy at a low uh, uh, at, at a faster rate right now let's say if i give this same enzyme if this same enzyme i give a substrate like this let's say this is another substrate if i give this substrate to the enzyme will it react will it react it won't react because this substrate will not fit to the active site so enzymes are also very specific to their action so what is a substrate some of you are asking me what is a substrate a substrate is that substance on which the enzyme will act let's say a protein digesting enzyme is acting on protein okay a protein digesting enzyme is acting on protein so the protein is the substrate and the, the enzyme is the enzyme or the catalyst okay um so this so in case of enzymes in case of enzymes we see that okay uh, in case of enzymes we see that they are very specific in their function they are very specific in their function okay and why is it called a catalyst catalyst because it accelerates the rate of reaction that is it increases the rate of reaction and two because it remains unchanged before and after the reaction the word catalysis means it carries out a catalyzing reaction it, it acts like an a catalyst and carries out a reaction okay or carries out catalysis 
all right so this is what enzymes do. so what are the properties of enzymes the first property of enzyme is that it will speed up a reaction so most of the reactions that take place in your body can actually take place without an enzyme but it will take too much time so without enzymes it will take too much <clears throat> time and energy and it will take so much energy that energy might be so high the requirement of energy might be so high that it might actually burn the cell okay or destroy the cell so enzymes carry out reactions at low energy low low uh, 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 you know temperature levels at our body temperature without uh, taking too much time okay number 2 they are required in small amounts and after they have been used they can be reused okay so because they remain unchanged before and after the reaction they can be reused so if even if you can uh, you know have a small amount of enzyme release that can go a long way obviously they are very specific in their action just now i told you that the substrate has to be complementary to the active site so for example pepsin which is a protein digesting enzyme will act on proteins so one day if you tell pepsin you know today i have not taken any protein i have only taken carbohydrate and fat today you don't have to act on protein today you act on fat pepsin will say no i cannot do that i am designed so that i can act on protein i'll act on protein whenever you have protein i'll act till then i'll sit and relax okay so they are very specific in their function next it works best at an optimum temperature and at an optimum ph now let us understand this uh, uh this what this means it works bet best at an optimum ph and an optimum temperature let's under let's quickly understand what an optimum ph and optimum temperature means so optimum ph means that you know if if you if you consider let's say if you consider the enzymes of our body the enzymes of our body works best at 37 degrees celsius now if you this is for the human enzymes so the human enzymes work best at 37 degrees celsius now if you give the if you rise the temperature to beyond 37 or if you decrease the temperature below 37 the rate of enzyme action decreases you will see that the rate of at which the enzyme is acting becomes slower so if you look at a graph you will see let's say if this is 37 degrees celsius for our body and this is below 37 this is above 37 the rate of enzyme action peaks at 37 and then it drops here the rate of enzyme action peaks at 37 and then it drops okay so this temperature is known as the optimum temperature so this is the rate of reaction you will see the rate of reaction peaks at 37 degrees celsius and then it lowers down again so you know this is this is something that happens uh, you know when you have fever so your body temperature let's say your because you have fever your body temperature has gone up to 38 39 degrees celsius right and in that case you will see that you are not being able to digest too much complex food you are not feeling hungry because your digestive system is not working too well because your body temperature has gone up your enzymes are not working at their best now this temperature is called optimum temperature the word optimum means it's not too high it's not too low so you cannot say that there is no temperature above 37 there is but there or there is no temperature below 37 there is but the you know the uh, enzyme works best at this temperature all right this is known as uh, optimum temperature similarly optimum ph now what is ph ph is the negative log of hydrogen ion concentration it is the negative log of hydrogen ion concentration if you do not understand this at least you know it is the measure of it is the measure of acidity acidic or alkaline condition so if a, if the ph is 7 if the ph value is 7 it is neutral which is drinking water if the ph value goes below 7 then it is acidic if the ph value goes above 7 then it is alkaline okay 
So, in case of certain organisms, uh, in case of certain enzymes, we find that the enzyme works best at a certain pH. For example, the enzyme pepsin, which is present in your stomach, it works best as at an acidic pH and that pH is 2. If you increase or decrease the pH, again the temperature will, uh, again you will see that the, uh, the uh, you know, the rate of reaction decreases. Or if the, you know, another, another example would be uh, trypsin, which is another enzyme which is present in your uh, intestine, that acts best at pH 7.8, around 7.8, slightly alkaline. If you decrease the pH too much to acidic, it will not act. Okay, so optimum pH, every enzyme has a specific temperature and a specific pH at which their rate is the highest, but the rate decreases if you increase or decrease the temperature. Now, you, you might ask me why, but since you didn't ask me, I am asking you, can you tell me why quickly, very quickly give it a try, why do you think enzymes will, will you know, have their rate decreased, or decreased if you increase or decrease the pH? Why do you think this happens? that beyond and below the optimum temperature and pH, the enzyme action becomes less. Absolutely, Pranav has already given me the correct answer. Samir has, is very close. Prithviraj, I will come to you. One second, wait. Is there anyone else? The question is, if you increase the temperature or decrease the temperature below optimum or if you change the optimum pH, why will the rate of reaction reduce why will the rate of reaction reduce okay so i've got two correct answers i have got two correct answers the answer is let's say your enzyme looks like this let's say your enzyme looks like this and your substrate looks like this if you change the ph changed ph or temperature the structure of the enzyme will change and then the active site, the structure of the active site might also change and the substrate will not be able to attach to it. So when you change the temperature or when you change the pH, the structure of the enzyme which is a protein changes. Always when you change the pH or change the temperature, protein gets denatured or the protein structure gets, you know, altered. If the structure is altered, the shape of the active site will also be altered and if that is altered, the substrate will not be able to attach to it. All right. So let us quickly come to the different types of. Let us quickly come to the different types of digestive enzymes that we have: protease, amylase, and lipase. These are the three types of digestive enzymes. So starting with protease, protease are those enzymes which acts on protein. So if you have had milk, if you have had mushrooms, uh, if you had have soybean, meat, uh, egg, etc., they will act on protein and they will convert it into their simplest forms which is amino acids. This is the simplest form of protein in which your body can absorb protein. Amylases, they can act on carbohydrate. So if you have had food rich in carbohydrate like rice, potato, etc. They convert it into glucose, fructose and galactose. These are the three simplest forms of carbohydrate. All these can be absorbed by the body. And lipases which acts on lipid converts it into the simplest form which are fatty acid and glycerol, fatty acid and glycerol, okay. Hold your questions as of now, I will answer all your questions later at the end of the class because you are asking questions which will be automatically answered as I proceed with the class. So just hold on, if the video is lagging seriously, there is nothing much I can do as of now, so you have to just bear with me because my uh, so connection is absolutely fine, so you will have to bear with me right now. Okay, so let us let's come, uh, let us move on. So, as we can see, we have three types of enzymes, protease, uh, amylase and lipase. 
So, so any the name of the enzymes usually end with A S E. So all this in this chapter you will see uh, that we are um, we will talk about enzymes where the uh, uh, names will be talked about and we'll see that most of them end with A S E. Those names which have been given before they might not, but but most of the names end with A S E. The new ones which have been given they end with A S E. Okay. Now let us move on to the human elementary system so the human elementary canal as you all as i just told you is basically the canal which starts from the mouth as you can see it starts from the mouth and it uh, you know follows through what is happening here so it starts from the mouth and as you can see it is it goes down through the thorax into the abdomen and in the abdominal region you have a major part of the elementary canal so we will stop we will talk about this entire elementary canal as of now we will start with the just knowing the names of the parts so the parts of the human elementary canal this is a very good diagram that you can refer to i will like to mention here that in the book the diagram that is given there are certain mistakes in that diagram in the sense that um, you know the liver uh, here also there is a certain mistake so, so uh, the liver should be in front of the liver should be in front of the stomach which I will just do here it is not a big deal so the liver should be in front of the stomach so in your book as I think I guess uh, what they have done is they have uh, uh, you know uh, certain parts they have not connected so one day I will show you how to draw the diagram because this is one, this is a very important diagram for your examinations also okay so let us start with the parts so we have these five parts that six parts that we will talk about mouth esophagus stomach small intestine which consists of duodenum jejunum and ileum large intestine which consists of cecum colon and rectum and finally the anus or the opening okay the opening that through which the food undigested food comes out okay so let us start with mouth mouth has three important regions first of all what is mouth mouth is the transverse slit so mouth is basically the transverse slit that leads to the buccal cavity the oral cavity okay so it is the transverse slit that leads to the oral cavity that part is known as the mouth and inside the oral cavity you have three important things one the teeth tongue and taste buds okay so let us talk about the teeth first in our case in case of human beings we have um, 32 teeth and as you know that all our teeth they do not look alike so all of them do not look alike we have tooth which look different from each other and this kind of a uh, denture is known as heterodont denture or heterodont kind of teeth what does heterodont mean heterodont means that all the teeth don't look or or just in simple words we have different teeth are of different shapes for different functions so that is known as hetero hetero meaning meaning different and don't meaning teeth is there too much lag again is there too much lag again uh, what do you think now is there too much lag now is it all right now <coughs> okay so heterodont meaning that they are of different shapes the teeth they are of different shape shapes because they have different functions so as you can see on the basis of the shape we have four different types of types of tooth the first one the first four in the upper and the lower jaw the first four the front four teeth that you can see in the upper and the lower jaw they are known as incisors and these incisors are responsible for cutting biting gnawing gnawing means to just you know scrape like like rabbits or rats do they just gnaw or, or just you know scrape the upper layers that is gnawing okay then you have one canine each you can easily hold a mirror in front of you and check if you have all of these so canines which help in tearing 
slash so you will see that in case of uh, you will see in case of um, uh, dogs and cats and tigers etc they have very sharp canines because they have to tear off raw flesh at one point of time our ancestors also had very sharp canines but from the time we have started cooking food from the time we have started uh, you know using fire to make food soft our canines have been used less to tear off flesh raw flesh and our canines have been reduced okay then you have two premolars which are basically for crushing and grinding okay they are for crushing and grinding so when you are biting an apple you use some part of your canine and you also use some part of your incisors you are, if you are biting from the front you are using only the incisors if you are biting from the side you are using the canine maybe a little bit and some of the incisors so the premolars they have a broad base as you can see the base is broad okay even in this case the base is broad so they act as a surface on which food can be you know crushed okay and uh, uh, you know ground molars we have three and they are also for the same purpose that is crushing and grinding so we have five on each side so we have almost 10 teeth for crushing and grinding okay masticating that is now in case of human beings this last molar which is known as the wisdom tooth this last molar which is known as the wisdom tooth this one comes out very late in in uh, the life cycle so like for instance i am having my wisdom tooth right now okay the the reason being that this one is of a very little use for us even without the last molar we have perfectly you know a perfect pair of teeth to be a teeth to be able to grind and crush food we have two premolars two molars so four enough four on each side on each jaw enough for crushing and grinding okay but you see in case of uh, those who, who get their last wisdom tooth, it is re really of no use. Maybe along with evolution at one point of time, we will actually lose the wisdom tooth. Okay. So what is our uh, then dental formula? We say there's a dental formula. Okay. The dental formula, you don't have to know this. This is, I'm again going a little beyond uh, NCRT, but dental formula is incisors two by two meaning i am taking one half of the jaw so you are taking one half of the upper jaw and the lower jaw so you have two incisors on the upper jaw two incisors on the lower jaw i am taking one side of the face okay i am taking one side of the face so incisors one two by two comma then you have c canines one by one so one on the upper jaw one on the lower jaw okay then you have premolars two by two so two on the upper jaw and two on the lower jaw and finally you have molars three by three that is three on the upper jaw and three on the lower jaw okay so total how many do you have here then so two plus two four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen okay sixteen this is one side of your face so if you multiply it with two you get the other side of your face also which is thirty two you should be thirty two but at this point of time i'm sure all of you have twenty eight okay because your wisdom tooth might not have come erupted yet all right so this is about the teeth heterodont again this is beyond ncrt dental formula beyond ncrt for your knowledge uh, our teeth they are implanted in a socket uh, yes that's all right our teeth they are implanted in a socket so this kind of tooth is known as thecodont so thecodont meaning the teeth remain implanted the teeth remain implanted in a socket okay and diphyodont we have diphyodont teeth meaning we have two sets of teeth one which we call milk tooth which falls off and then we develop our permanent teeth okay so these three heterodont thecodont and diphyodont these are not there in ncrt I'm just giving you extra information, so I'm letting you know. Now, coming to the next part, which is the tongue, a very, very important part of our, uh, you know, uh, buccal cavity. The tongue is a muscular organ. It is a muscular organ which is uh, anteriorly fixed, sorry, anteriorly free and posteriorly fixed, which is posteriorly fixed. And this, uh, this muscle, this muscle is skeletal in origin. How do you know this is skeletal muscle in origin? Because 
uh, we can move it. Uh, you cannot. You can. You can move your skeletal muscles. Uh, for, you know, with with your own will. So you can move your tongue along with you. Uh, so they are voluntary in nature. So you can move them. So that is why they are voluntary. Okay, you have control over it. Now the tongue mainly helps to keep the food in position when you are you are chewing it. The tongue mainly helps to mix the saliva with the food. Also, the tongue has got taste buds. So, if you see the structure of the tongue, you will be able to see these kind of small projections which are present everywhere in the tongue. These are known as papillae. Plural is papillae and singular is papilla. Okay. Now, these papillae, if you look at one papillae, you will be able to see. If you look at one papilla, sorry, you will be able to see. It's like a bump. So, you will be able to see that just below the papilla, there are nerve cells. There are nerve cells which have their neurons, their axons connect, you know, going to the brain, towards the brain. And with their dendrite, dendrons, you have studied axon and dendron. With their dendron, they can easily sense taste. Okay. So, anything which has taste, we, we have primarily four tastes that is sweet, sour, sweet, sour, um, salt and bitter. We have primarily four tastes, sweet, sour, salt and bitter. I will talk about another taste in a little bit. So, all those they, they can get into the papillae through a pore. So, there is a pore in the papillae. There is a pore in the papillae through which the food can enter, touch the nerve and then the nerve can take it to the brain. So, this is the taste bud which is present below the papillae. Okay, this is called the taste bud. There is another taste which has been discovered in Japan which is known as umami. It has been proven that we also have separate taste buds for umami like we have for the other four. Okay, and umami is the taste of garlic. Anything that has garlic in it, you know that it has a garlicky flavor. So, garlic, non-vegetarian food or even yeah, monosodium glutamate, which we call ajinomoto, that is used a lot in Chinese food. That onion, those have this kind of, you know, taste, which is known as umami. All right. So, umami is the fourth taste. Now, after the mouth, after the food has been masticated in the mouth, what is the meaning of mastication? What is the meaning of mastication? Mastication means chewing. During chewing, you not only crush the food, Chewing results in not only crushing the food, but also results in mixing the food with the saliva. You mix the food with the saliva, okay? And you convert the food into a bolus. Now, what is a bolus? A bolus is basically a round mass, a round soft mass that you convert food into. Just imagine you have taken dry biscuits. You chew it, mix it with the saliva and finally it turns into a round mass which is known as the bolus. Right, So, that bolus can easily pass to the next part of your uh, elementary canal which is known as the esophagus. So, this esophagus is a hollow muscular tube uh, which uh, joins the mouth, which joins the mouth or, or not you shouldn't say mouth which joins the uh, uh, you know the uh, oral cavity to the stomach. And this kind of movement that you can see, this movement is known as peristalsis. Okay, what happens in peristalsis? Let's say if I give you a rubber tube, okay, if I give you a rubber tube and I put a ball, so I give you a rubber tube and I put, introduce a ping pong ball from one side and the ball is stuck and I ask you to take the ball out from the other side, what will you do? So I have taken a rubber tube, I have put a ping pong ball from one side and the ball is stuck inside. And I want you to take out the ball from the other side of the tube. What will you do? Okay. So, some of you are saying that you have to press it. Can you tell me which region you have to press? You have to press the region behind the ball so that the ball slips forward. And then you press again so the ball slips forward again. So, by pressing, by alternate pressing, you can take the ball outside the tube. So, the same thing happens here. You see, when the bolus is moving through, through the esophagus, the region where the bolus is present, that region is expanded. So, this region is expanded. And the region which is above and below, those regions are constricted. 
those regions are constricted okay next the expanded region will constrict and the constricted region will expand and slowly the food will slip so we call this peristalsis alternate contraction and relaxation helping the food to move down and this doesn't only happen in the esophagus it happens all throughout the alimentary canal and it also happens in other parts of our body okay like in the excretory system also it happens when i teach you excretory system i'll tell you so there is no such you know the the main function of the esophagus is to get the food from the oral cavity into the stomach and when it reaches the stomach you see the structure of the stomach this is the main region for protein digestion and the stomach consists of few parts so the first part where the food actually so this is the esophagus i will just divide it with blue and then i will label it all right so so this is the esophagus and this is the next part which is duodenum so the stomach can be divided into three main regions this region which is known as the fundus the upper part which is known as the fundus the main part which is known as the body not three sorry uh, uh, four regions the upper the main part which is known as the body this part where the esophagus enters it is known as the cardiac stomach because it is very close to the heart so it is known as the cardiac stomach and that is why any gas accumulation in the stomach can cause a heart pain it almost gives a heart attack like pain in the heart and the last part is known as the pyloric stomach or the pylorus okay the pylorus the word pyloric means posterior so the last or the last end or the posterior end is known as the pyloric stomach stomach okay now here where the stomach where the esophagus opens into the stomach here there is a circular band of muscle okay uh, i will i will answer your questions at the end of the class so here there is a circular band of muscle and here also there is a circular band of muscle they are they act as rubber bands okay they act as rubber bands they allow food to come from the esophagus into the stomach and this one allows food to go from the stomach into the duodenum but it does not allow backflow backflow is not allowed so these rubber band shape these bands these circular band of muscles they are known as sphincters so what what are sphincters they are circular band of muscles that prevent food from flowing in the reverse direction it prevents food from flowing in the reverse direction something that valves do they allow food to pass in only one direction now if you ask me you know what happens when i am vomiting okay so when you are vomiting your stomach gives a gives a lot of pressure and because of this pressure the sphincter is forced to open and then food comes out by reverse peristalsis so when you are when you are vomiting something toxic has accumulated in your stomach and because of that accumulation your stomach is churning and it gives a lot of pressure you have you must have noticed that before you actually vomit you have a lot of uneasiness in yourself in your stomach and that uneasiness actually is because the stomach is churning and trying to push the toxic food whatever you have eaten whatever you know bad stuff you have eaten to get it out and when the stomach finally is able to contract that is when the esophagus this sphincter the, the this particular sphincter this one will open and the food will come out by reverse peristalsis this sphincter since it is present at the junction between the esophagus and the stomach it is known as the esophageal sphincter and this sphincter since sphincter this is since it is present at the pyloric end this one is known as the pyloric sphincter the function of a sphincter and the valve are the same the structure is different so sphincter is in the form of a circular band of muscle valve is in form of a flap but the function remains the same wherever whatever suits that is present okay so stomach is the main region for uh, digestion of protein and the wall of the stomach if you see the wall of the stomach 
this wall of the stomach this is the let's say this is the inner wall of the stomach in certain regions the inner wall of the stomach is thrown into small you know pits like this and they release you know this is the inner wall as you can see this inner wall has been thrown into pits like this these are known as gastric glands so the stomach also has small the inner wall is thrown into small pits so if you see here there will be small pits like this and these pits are known as gastric glands and these gastric glands they help in releasing the juice the gastric juice we'll talk about the juices later in the next class okay so these are known as gastric glands which releases enzymes okay next we come to small intestine so the small intestine consists of three regions duodenum jejunum and ileum uh, the jejunum uh no they are the, the no no the gastric glands are present all over i just drew it in the fundus region so there are three regions duodenum jejunum and ileum so the duodenum starts from the stomach so this part is the duodenum this part is the jejunum and this part is the ileum so if you look at it if you look at the stomach so let's say this is the stomach okay this is the end of the stomach here there is a c shaped region so the duodenum is a c shaped part of the small intestine it is the first part the c shaped part which starts from the stomach it is known as the duodenum duodenum duo means 12 denum means finger so duodenum basically has the length of your 12 fingers so if you just put 12 fingers side by side whatever is the length that is the length of your duodenum and then you have this really coiled part then you have this really coiled part i'm not drawing it so you have this really coiled part which is known as the jejunum and ileum now jejunum and ileum from outside you really cannot differentiate between the two you really cannot differentiate it from outside but if you see the inner content you will see that jejunum has more undigest has more food which has not yet been digested ileum has more food that has been digested and that is being absorbed and jejunum and ileum externally they don't show any uh, differentiation any distinction there is no such demarcation as it this is where jejunum ends and this is where ileum begins okay now this entire intestine is responsible for digestion and absorption of food so digestion of course enzymes are there just like in case of the stomach the inner wall of the intestine also has pits which are known as intestinal glands so there are two types of intestinal glands we'll talk about that one type is known as crypts somewhere it will be written as c so that's all right crypts of leber kuhn is one type of gland another type of gland is bruner's gland these two are known as intestinal glands these two are known as intestinal glands they are also present uh, in the duodenum intest uh, jejunum and ileum and they are just like gastric glands okay they are known as intestinal glands so this is about digestion we'll come to digestion but abs for absorption the inner wall of the intestine is thrown into finger like projections so the inner wall is thrown into finger like projections which are known as villi now let us understand the structure of villi first and then we'll see why we have these villi first of all the villi basically are projections which are covered by a thin epithelial tissue so there is a epithelial tissue layer okay and inside the villi you have these which are the capillaries okay and inside you also have a lymph vessel which is known as lacteal lacteal carries lymph lymph is basically a a uh, lymph is basically um, a fluid a white milky fluid that flows in our body we'll talk about that in transport okay so what does villi do villi absorbs the food from the intestine and gives it to blood or lacteal now what kind of food goes to blood anything that is water soluble goes to blood so water soluble food like protein carbohydrate with water soluble vitamins they go to blood okay and fat soluble food anything that is soluble in fat like uh, uh lipids or fat soluble vitamin that they go to lacteals so lacteals or that contains lymph one second lacteals lacteal is the vessel and the vessel contains so it goes to the capillaries and it go this one goes to lymph which is 
uh, lacteals. All right. So the villi. Wh wh why is it villi? Wh why is villi present? No, the the epithelial tissue that covers the villi. This is cuboidal epithelium. It is not a columnar. It is ciliated. Uh, sorry, cuboidal epithelium with brush border. So why is villi present? Villi is present to increase the surface area for absorption. Will absorption take place without the villi? Yes, but if you increase villi, then the rate of absorption will be more. Why? Listen to this. So let's say if I give you only this much length, I have given you only this much length and I have told you that only this much length is available for your absorption. Only this much length is available for your absorption. Then you have only this much length to absorb. But in the same length, if you can, if the same length can be thrown into a finger like projection, you are basically increase the surface for absorption. So the length remains the same, but because of the fold, the surface increases. So Willy basically increases the surface area for absorption of food. All right. We come to one last question about the intestine. In case of herbivores, we find that the intestine is larger and in case of uh, yeah, so in case of carnivores, we find that the small intestine is smaller. Okay, why? What is the reason? In case of herbivores, the herbivores need to digest cellulose. Now, cellulose needs a lot of time, needs a lot of time to digest, to get digested. Okay, so that is why if you have a longer intestine, food will take a long time to pass it will take its own time to pass through the uh, intestine and therefore you will get more time to digest the cellulose okay on the other hand carnivores or omnivores like us we have smaller intestine because we anyway cannot digest cellulose whatever we can digest it can get digested faster and therefore our intestine is smaller Okay, so if there is more coil in the intestine, if the intestine is longer and if there is more coil in the intestine, the food will take longer to pass through and that will mean you get, you get more time to digest cellulose that happens in case of herbivores. Coming to the last part which is the large intestine which consists of cecum, colon, rectum and anus. Uh, again, I, I would like to just mention here the large intestine is called large because its diameter is larger than the small intestine. The small intestine is called small because its diameter is narrower, but the length is definitely larger than the large intestine. Okay, So the large intestine consists of cecum, which is the first part. This part is known as the cecum, where the small intestine uh, opens. This part is known as the cecum. Okay, this is where the small intestine opens. This is a head like structure and here you also have a small finger like projection which is known as appendix. It is of no use for us. In our ancestors, this was in use to digest cellulose. Then the part of the large intestine that goes up here, this part, this part is known as the colon and since this part goes up, since this part goes up, this part is known as the ascending colon okay then the part which goes from the right side of your body to the left side of your body this part of the colon is known as the descending one second this part of the colon is known as sorry it is known as the transverse colon I will just take 5 more minutes to finish today's class and then the part which comes down this part is known as the descending colon because it comes down and finally this S shape part this S shape because you see that colon went up right side of your body then when they, it went from the right side of your body to the left side of your body then it came down to the left side of your body but the opening of the anus is at the center so it has to come to the center so when it takes an s shaped turn and comes to the center this is known as the sigmoid colon okay the colon has three parts then first part is the cecum of course and then the colon goes up which is the ascending colon then it goes from the right to the left side of the body and then it comes down and then it takes an S shaped turn and comes to the center. Okay, so you have the ascending colon, the transverse colon, the descending colon and the sigmoid colon and they all help in absorption of water and converting liquid undigested food into solid fecal matter or what we call stool. 
okay so that is why if the colon is infected by amoeba you have loose motion because the colon when it is in infected it is incapable of absorbing this excess water and that is when large volume of water goes out of your body okay next you have the rectum which is the region which is an inverted flask shaped structure this rectum is the inverted flask shaped structure where where fecal matter is stored and then temporarily temporarily stored and then released and finally the opening of the rectum is known as the anus through which the undigested food is given out okay so the large intestine has these four regions so we will straight away go to the summary so what have we done today we have basically talked about i will take all your questions later so basically we have talked about the parts of the digestive system elementary canal the parts of the elementary canal we have talked about the parts mainly their structure we have not really gone into the details of the function but we have definitely talked about villi in details we have talked about um, uh, you know uh, uh, the enzymes and their activities which is very important and we have also talked about we have also talked about uh, details of peristalsis teeth tongue taste buds okay that is all that i had to teach you today before i take your questions i will like to remind you that we have physics chemistry mathematics and biology classes for classes 8 9 and 10 cbsc we also have physics chemistry and mathematics classes for classes 8 9 and 10 icsc and we have master coding with java classes python programming classes and physics and chemistry classes for cambridge igcsc please feel free to join and share with your friends so that we have more people with us okay so thank you so very much for being with me uh, today and that is all that i had to teach you today next class we will go on with the digestive glands and digestion uh, so have a great evening thank you